Our projects range from population studies where we're taking a look at survival of fawns, survival of adults, to fawn recruitment. We learned a long time ago that if you're going to be successful darting deer here, you've got to do things with night vision. Managers are increasingly understanding the importance of managing not just food plots for deer habitat, but also on managing native cover types as well. It's kind of run through the drugs we use to uh, when we're working up deer and what we chemically immobilize them with. We guide them, we mentor them throughout this process, but at the end of the day, they are, they are functioning professionals and we're extremely proud of what they do when they're here. I'm Dr. Steve Ditchkoff. I'm professor of wildlife ecology at Auburn University in the School of Forestry and Wildlife Sciences. Eyes potentially changed. To look at body size of coyotes. I'm involved with research with large mammals and specifically focus my research on white-tailed deer and wild pigs. The deer research program at Auburn is, uh, is multifaceted. Uh, there's, there's multiple moving parts, uh, different aspects to it, and it's constantly, it's been evolving since I've been here since 2001. We have projects going on in multiple states from Alabama to South Carolina. Uh, we have graduate students that are in the field collecting data 12 months of the year. Our projects range from population studies where we're taking a look at survival of fawns, survival of adults, to fawn recruitment, to movement studies, to other studies that are examining basic biology such as reproductive success and antler development, as well as other management questions. There's multiple individuals involved in this. There's myself, there's Dr. Will Goolsby. Uh, Dr. Goolsby focuses on a lot of habitat and forest management type questions, whereas I do a lot of things with uh, population dynamics and movement and basic biology. My name is Dr. Will Goolsby. I'm an assistant professor in wildlife sciences at Auburn University. I work with Dr. Uh, Steve Ditchkoff in the Deer Lab. I've been here since about 2015, and our research complements each other uh, pretty well a significant portion of my research focuses on habitat management for deer, specifically focusing on um, using forest management actions, for example, to improve cover and nutritional content of areas uh, where deer are being managed. We also have a deer research facility about 20 miles north of campus in Camp Hill, Alabama. It's a 430-acre high-fence facility that was established in 2007. Our intent with the development of our research facility was to, to develop intimate knowledge of individuals in a functioning population and follow them through their life. We have approximately 100 to 120 adults in our facility at any one time. Um, we know who those individuals are. We capture them multiple times during their lifetime. During those captures, we collect data such as tissue samples, we draw blood, we get antler measurements and body growth measurements, we take a look at parasite loads, and really get a good understanding of what makes these animals tick. What are the stresses that they're exposed to? What other deer are they interacting with? And one, something that's really unique about this facility is you know, when we pull tissue samples, we can essentially do a, construct a family tree and determine the mother and father of every individual in that facility which is really unique because we can determine reproductive success and really begin to unravel the aspects of reproduction of white-tailed deer. You know, which males do the breeding? Is it the largest antlered males? Is it the heaviest bodied males? Is it the oldest males? Is it males with certain testosterone patterns? Now what we have is we have a dart that will allow us to, through radio telemetry, we can track the deer. So it does sound like it's somewhat consistent over here at least. A big part of what we do requires us to catch deer every year. I'm Chad Newbolt. I've worked with Steve Ditchkoff in the Deer Lab for, I guess since, it's been since October of 2007, so going on 13 years now. A big part of what we do requires us to catch deer every year. So what we do is from about October until March, that's when deer in our area have hard antlers. We're primarily targeting bucks, but we're really also targeting darting any animal that's untagged. A lot of what we do is um, based on um, some genetic work and things like that. So it requires us to get our hands on animals at least one time during their life. So, so what we're doing right now is we're focused primarily on, on capturing bucks, but if we get an opportunity to, to dart a doe that hasn't been darted in the past, we'll, we'll dart her too tonight.
We're gonna put, put some corn out. All of our all of our stands are about 18 yards from our bait piles. So most of the time we use more permanent uh, feeders and more permanent sites, but this time of year we've been darting for a while, so our our deer or bucks are getting a little bit a little bit leery. So we start hitting up some areas, maybe they some stands that hadn't been been shot over as much, and it can help us get some some animals that have eluded us for for most of the year. So so this is one of those spots. So we're aiming right on the back ham uh, because that's where the most muscle is. Um, the uh, drug we're using is uh, best intramuscular, so less that can go wrong in that area. Uh, we try our best to avoid the stomach area especially. While Jay sits and waits, hoping for a deer to dart, let's go back to camp and learn from graduate student Nick Deeg exactly what's being used to tranquilize the deer. So I just kind of run through the drugs we use to uh, when we're working up deer and what we chemically immobilize them with. Essentially we use uh, tealazole, which is a disassociative anesthetic, and then we use xylazine, which is just a sedative. So we mix those two drugs together and uh, make a, it's a, just a drug concoction that works uh, a little bit better, we found, than each drug independently. So what this does is essentially you dart the deer, comes out of the dart gun, sticks in the deer, and then injects the drug into the muscle. It's an inner muscular injection. We'll be able to track the deer after it uh, goes down, and then you'll just hear like the beeps like this, and we'll be able to track where the deer's at with the dart. If only you could put radio transmitters in your broadheads, am I right? Let's check back on Jace. With the buck slowing down, Jake's knows something must have gone wrong with the shot. After watching the buck disappear into the woods, Jace quietly climbs down to investigate. And just like normal hunting, buck fever sets in, and sometimes we shoot just a little too high. Luckily for Jace, the night is still young, and the corn pile is still tall. Time to get back in the stand. Well, you shoot over it. Yeah. Okay. Aim a little lower next time. Yeah. All right. Good luck. Being that this is a research facility and they aren't actually hunting, Jace is able to utilize a night vision scope and hunt past dark. So when a buck stepped out in the dark, there was no hesitation. Time to track. Yeah, it's got hair on it. bent the crap on see if it's got drugs in it. They were able to locate the dart, but it bounced right out of the deer without injecting a significant amount of tranquilizer. They aren't giving up hope for the night, but for now let's take a look at another successful recovery to display what happens next in the process. You know, just kind of go over his nose so he can still breathe good. There you go. So, I'm gonna go 32.5 for his skull length, and then for his body length, that adds on. It's pretty straight. <laughs> We're gonna add on to his sculling. After all the measurements are recorded, a blood sample is drawn, the antlers are swabbed for fungus, and a tissue sample is taken to later determine the genealogy of the deer. Age is gonna influence breeding in deer in a number of ways. I think one of the mistakes that deer managers most often make when it comes to their hardwood forest is thinking that 
hardwood forests only provide mast in terms of acorns uh, during the fall and winter. Let's head back to the classroom for a couple quick management lessons from Drs. Ditchkoff and Goldsby. Age is going to influence breeding in deer in a number of ways. Number one, as a deer gets older, you're going to have increased body size, you're going to have increased antler size. You're also going to have increased testosterone levels. And so as a deer gets older, it's going to become more dominant within the system, and you're going to find those more dominant males, those older males, tend to get more breeding opportunities than younger males. However, you know, all things being equal, a larger individual is going to have a greater breeding opportunity, more breeding opportunities than smaller individuals. The way we're managing deer in, in the eastern U.S. has kind of changed in the last 20 years. Um, and this has been because of coyotes. Coyotes are not native to the eastern United States. The reason this is important is they tend to be very efficient predators of white-tailed deer fawns. With influx of coyotes, an increasing number of coyotes, and as a result, increasing predation pressure on fawns, we were having a natural decrease in fawn recruitment combined with high maintained levels of antlerless harvest and these two things together can be difficult to maintain sometimes. And so what we're seeing is deer biologists are starting to focus more and more in the eastern U.S. on fawn recruitment rates. So in addition to getting information on the condition of the herd through body weight and lactation and that sort of thing, we're also trying to take a look at fawn recruitment rates or the, the number of fawns per 100 does that are recruited into the population at six months of age. This is a real good indicator of the level of predation that's occurring in a population. And when we have low fawn recruitment rates, that tells us that we need to kind of back off a little bit on our antlerless harvest so we don't drive deer numbers lower than we hope to. I think one of the mistakes that deer managers most often make when it comes to their hardwood forest is thinking that hardwood forests only provide mast in terms of acorns uh, during the fall and winter. Certainly acorn mast, uh, or um, oak mast rather, is an important dietary component of white-tailed deer during that fall and winter period. But what a lot of managers aren't aware of is that it is possible to manage hardwood forests in a way that they provide both that acorn mast and provide nutritious forage during the spring and summer as well as cover during that period as well. And the number one most limiting factor uh, preventing these areas from providing those things during the spring and summer is canopy cover. And so in hardwood stands, um, managers could, can potentially have the option to go through, identify uh, hardwood species that have limited value to deer. You know, some examples might be uh, yellow poplar, or sweet gum and remove those trees, thereby allowing more sunlight to reach the ground, stimulating that nutritious forage and cover that deer can utilize during the spring and summer as well, while still retaining the productive oak trees in that stand. In reality, the average deer hunter can do something to prevent dispersal. The cause of dispersal is essentially the mother or that doe tends to push that, that buck fawn away um, or that yearling buck away. Um, she doesn't want him around, she's not social with him, and so there becomes increased pressure for him to disperse to a new area. A hunter can actually reduce rates of dispersal, and we do it all the time, through antlerless harvest. Any time that you go out and you harvest a female, you're essentially orphaning a fawn, if, if, if that doe does have fawns. And it's been shown that, there's a, that this has an impact on those young bucks, that there's a higher percentage of those young bucks actually stay in their natal range than would normally be found. So when you increase doe harvest rates, what you actually do is you decrease the number of young bucks that are emigrating off of a property. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by If you joined us last week, you learned about a new opportunity for whitetail hunters that is simply incredible. It's a whitetail hunting challenge that rewards hunters big bucks for capturing fair chase hunts on camera. It's the million dollar Buck Bash Challenge, powered by Apex Competitions. 
This whitetail challenge is designed for all level of hunters, providing huge rewards, offering over 150 plus harvest categories. And each state has nearly $600,000 of payout with a special $1 million payday for the harvest of an official Boone and Crockett state record. Apex truly is dedicated to rewarding hunters for their commitment and dedication of capturing the hunt. Each first time hunter that enters receives a free 4K camera and accessories, everything needed to begin their whitetail challenge. Then after a hunter, that's you, captures their harvest, they utilize the Apex digital score form provided with their entry to submit their antler score and video. The form is designed to make scoring easy by simply entering the ending measurement of each measurable antler location using the provided Apex antler measuring tape. The score form auto calculates the gross score and then it's on to the video upload. Hunters submit their video in segments with an easy step-by-step -step process, starting with the hunter, then the location, which is merely a camera pan from the hunter's tree stand or blind. Then it's the harvest shot, the recovery, which includes a smartphone photo and the applied apex antler measuring tape showing the measured score. They even provide a video trim feature. Yeah, I need that. Making it so easy to trim the beginning or end of a video to meet upload requirements. This platform is so well thought out, making it a seamless process for hunters. And clearly, it was designed for maintaining the highest level of integrity to verify each hunter's harvest. Another thing that is sure to pique hunters' interest is the blind leaderboard. Scores remain hidden until the end of the season. Each submitted harvest is a potential winner, with the leaderboard revealing the results on the Apex Competition's website. Typically, as hunters, we can't wait until the beginning of the season, and we never look forward to the end. But with the Apex Competition's, Putting away the gear is now potentially a huge payday. All this sounds amazing, right? But there is one limitation, the amount of hunters who can participate. Most states have hundreds of thousands of deer hunters, some in the millions. With Apex, each state challenge is limited to only 10,000 entries. Hunters reserve their entry at no cost. Official entry begins in August, with previous Apex hunters having priority to participate each season. You may want to reserve your spot sooner rather than later if you want to become an Apex hunter. To learn more, visit our friends at apexcompetitions.com.